Hello, here I am once again to provide you with third and final Japanese lecture. From now on, I will call these videos study sections, as this was the intention from the start, to learn alongside you rather than to teach you. So no excuses, I have given you the tools you need to understand my study sections and I have brought you to my level. At the end of this lecture, I will be able to put aside the role of a teacher and take on the role of a classmate. I'm not going to lie, it was quite a surreal experience to be teaching a language I haven't mastered myself yet, but it was also very rewarding. I not only reviewed the basics, but also came across some interesting facts, some of which I shared with you in the previous two videos. And yet, you probably have a few questions at the moment. Can I truly follow the reading sections, lyric analysis and everything else, having only watched your two previous videos? You ask me. And I reply that yes, I think it's perfectly possible as long as there is some effort on your part. Technically, you don't just have to watch the videos, you have to follow the instructions they contain. If you have done your homework, after watching Iragana and Katakana, then you are now able to convert the various characters into Romaji syllables. If you still can't, it's not the end of the world. I will be using Romaji in my study sections, as I want to make them as accessible as possible, but keep at the task of learning to read Kana, because many doors will open once you succeed. Now, this lesson is perhaps even more important, as it will be the foundation that will allow you to follow me as I read texts in Japanese. In Iragana and Katakana, I explained how to convert Japanese characters into sounds. Today, I'm going to teach you how to separate those sounds into words and associate them with their translation. I can still see some skepticism on your faces. Do you think it's too early to start consuming texts written by Japanese people for Japanese people? Then let me tell you a little story about how I accidentally learned French. The year was 2014 and the company had released the game that piqued my interest. The problem? The game was only available in French. Deciding not to wait for a translation, I made an account and played the game anyway. The result? A few months later, I was not only able to read the dialogues without any difficulty, but also had a presence in the forum. I even made French friends with whom I exchanged messages. It's been a few years since I quit that game, so I have lost fluency in the meantime, but recently I was able to read a book entitled L'Alliance de la Brebis, written by a cult survivor without any major difficulties. This is to exemplify how far pure immersion can take us. Of course, I must point out that Portuguese and French are sister languages, same structure, same similar words. Several times I came across untranslated Japanese games and it never even crossed my mind to try them. Japanese was simply too different from the languages I knew, namely Portuguese and English. So no, you can't learn Japanese by accident. You need to actively study the language. But this story shows the power of immersion and how it must be present in our studies at all times, even now when we are at the starting line. Shall we get started then? Let's take the following preposition as an example. In a manga where all the kanji are translated into hiragana through furigana, the phrase would appear as follows. And since you are now able to convert hiragana into sounds, you know the, that this sentence is read If I tell you that this phrase means I live together with my older sister, what conclusions can you draw? None, can you? First of all, you don't know how to divide words in the absence of spaces, which is something the Japanese language doesn't have. And even if the words were divided, you wouldn't be able to tell which one, for example, corresponds to the word sister. So let's break it down, starting with the division. If my previous video wasn't enough to convince you, this is the moment you will fall in love with kanji, because it's thanks to its existence 
that dividing a, sense, a sentence into its various components doesn't result in a completely tortuous process. This is not to say that every time there is an alternation between writing systems, you have to assume that there is a space. The method is not so linear, but this alternation gives us many clues as to when one word ends and another begins. Let me refresh your memory by repeating something I have already said in Iragana and Katakana. Although its case has its own particularities, in the first instance is it is safe to assume that lexical elements, nouns, adjective themes, verb themes, will appear written in kanji and that grammatical elements such as particles, conjunctions and some pronouns will appear written in Iragana. Katakana, on the other hand, is commonly used in the writing of foreign words. In onomatopoeia, for example, the sound of horses trotting in a manga, as well as for emphasis purposes. Returning to our example sentence and applying these principles, we get... In other words, Watashi wa ane to isho ni kurashetimasu. I live together with my older sister. Now let's move on to associating words with their translation. Something very important about Japanese sentences is that the natural position of the verb is at the end of the sentence. So this is the stem of the verb to live. This verb in Japanese is kurasu and ku is its stem. The grammatical part that follows the verb conjugates it for the present. So, ku rashitemas is actually a whole word, which is equivalent to live in the translation. In Japanese, the purpose of the beginning of a sentence is to create a context to feed the idea that is conveyed at the end. The essentials, therefore, appear at the end of the sentence, and these essentials are often conveyed by the verb, which is therefore the less flexible element less flexible? Do you mean that the elements of the sentence are like blocks in a game which can be moved around? Yeah, in a way that's exactly it. The existence of particles is the reason why they can be moved around in this way. Particles have no equivalent in the English language, they are simply what they are. Some dictate the relationship between each word and the verb in the sentence, while others specify relationships between words and even parts of sentences. Therefore, when an element moves in the sentence, its associated particle moves with it. Our example sentence has three particles, wa, to and ni. The particle wa indicates the topic of a sentence. This is who or what is being discussed. Sometimes it coincides with the subject of the sentence, but the particle doesn't indicate the subject. In I live together with my older sister, who is the sentence about? It's about me. So I will be associated with the particle wa. And so we know that watashi means I. The particle to can be used in a variety of contexts, like almost all particles, in fact. One of its most popular functions is to link two or more nouns, like the word and in English. Yet it is never used to link adjectives. In this context, however, it is used to express the relationship between two things, being equivalent to with. So, who do I live with? My older sister. What would precede to? This. So, ane means older sister. Finally, we have the particle ni. The use of this particle is very broad, and it should always be analyzed in the context of the sentence in which it is inserted. It can mean on, to, at, the, for, among others. In this case, it goes with isho, which means together. When isho is accompanied by the particle ni and follows the verb, the conjunction isho ni means doing something together or being with someone. In this case, that something is living. I live together with my sister. It should be noted that the use of the possessive pronoun my is not necessary. It is implied by the context. The subject could also have been omitted, something that happens a lot in Japanese. As particles are very important, I'm going to mention a few more that are essential, as well as reinforcing the meaning of the ones we have already seen. No indicates that the word that appears after the particle belongs to the one that appears before. 
This particle is also capable of turning words that are not, not nouns into nouns. When used at the end of a sentence, it gives the impression that something is being explained. 2. The meaning varies depending on the context. It can be used to link nouns to each other, as in a list of objects, for example, but it can also appear between sentences to indicate a relationship between them. When one occurs, the other also occurs. Or to indicate proximity in general, which is why the word wit is one of the possible translations for this particle. The particle can even be used to mark the end of a quotation. Yeah, similar to the particle to, in that is, it is used to link nouns. The difference is that when it is used in a list of names, it implies that the list is open, that other names could be added to it. Wa indicates what the main topic of the sentence is, whether it's a person, object, place or something else entirely. Everything that comes after the particle is related to the main subject which is what comes before. Ga indicates the one who performs an action or to whom a characteristic is attributed. Mo when placed in a sentence, it replaces the particles wa or ga. To or also are possible translations for this particle. It can also be used to emphasize something or when you want to ask permission to do something, in which case it's combined with e. O indicates the object of a sentence usually the direct object. For those of you who have forgotten what the object of a sentence is, it is what is affected by the action of a verb. D indicates what the action is done with or where the action takes place. In other words, it, el it tells us the means by which the action is carried out. E indicates direction when it comes to verbs relating to movement. Think of it as an arrow pointing to something. That something can be a place, a person, or something completely different. Care and Made. The first indicates the point of departure and the second the point of arrival. The points of departure and arrival can be local, temporal, or situational. Ni. A particle that appears very frequently in texts. It can be used to mark a destination, local, local or temporal, mark a purpose, mark a change, and so on. It can also turn an adjective into an adverb. There are many more particles, but these are the ones that usually appear in textbooks as the most basic. Anyway, I didn't mean to overload you with information. What I want you to retain is that it is the particles that reveal the role of each word or element in a sentence, and that it is thanks to them that there is so much flexibility when it comes to sentence construction. Let's look at some more fundamental characteristics of the Japanese language. It has no articles. The concept of plurality does not cause words to be written differently. Words have no grammatical gender. The conjugation of verbs does not vary according to the person. A verb in the future is conjugated in the same way as one in the present. Phrases that refer to a state of being do not require a verb. Formality is very important in the Japanese language. An extremely formal sentence is completely different from its purely casual equivalent. Thus, a very popular Japanese term is a copula, which is placed at the end of a sentence relating to the state of being in order to complement them. The term is often understood to be the verb to be itself, but let's try to keep an open mind and not assume a complete equivalence between one thing and the other. The particle ka is often placed at the end of a sentence to make it uh, an interrogation, although it is only one of several forms to turn a sentence into a question. In Japanese, the most basic form of a verb is called the dictionary form. Verbs in this form are affirmative, in the present tense, and can be used to create meaningful, meaningful sentences. The sentences that would result from using verbs in this form, however, would be considered very informal, with the mass form being more suitable for regular use. As a general rule, to convert a verb to the mass form from the dictionary form, you replace the syllable ending in U with its respective syllable ending in E and add mass. Note, however, that verbs ending in RU can belong to two different groups. 
Group 1 verbs are converted by replacing RU with RI and adding MAS. Group 2 verbs are converted by deleting RU and adding MAS. It's not possible to know when a verb ending in RU belongs to one group or another. It's the kind of sensi sensitivity you acquire with practice. The verbs to do, SURU, and to come, KURU, are conjugated differently and are the only two irregular verbs in the Japanese language. Suru becomes shimas and kuru becomes kimas. Once verbs are in the mas form, it's easy to convert them to the negative past and past negative, as you can see in this table. To convert verbs to the negative form from the dictionary form, you only have to replace the syllable ending in u with its respective syllable ending in a and add nai. As for irregular verbs, Suru becomes shinai and kuru becomes konai. Converting verbs to the past tense from the dictionary form is not so simple, as you can see from the table. Suru becomes shita and kuru becomes kita. The negative past tense is obtained by converting the verb, as it appears in the dictionary, to the negative and then replacing the e at the end with kata. So when we see the ending nakata, we immediately make the connection with the negative past. Finally, another very important verb form is the te form. It's identical to the ta form, except that instead of ta, we have te. This form has many uses, but its most notable role is as an anchor that connects actions, events or states, whether they are simultaneous or sequential. Therefore, it is very common that when a sentence has more than one verb, only the last one indicates the tense and that the previous ones are in the te form. The te form can also be used as a kind of imperative or linked to other words to communicate a wide variety of situations. Let's look at some examples. When you have the verb in the te form and you add iru or imas, it indicates that an action is taking place. When you have the verb in the te form and you add kure or kudasai, it indicates that the person is asking for a favor. When you have the verb in the te form and you add miru, it means to try something. When you have the verb in the te form and you add moi or i, it means the person is asking for something or granting permission. When you have the verb in the te form and you add ai can i or ai ke masen, the person is denying permission. You can also change a verb that is in the negative form to the negative te form by changing the e from nai to kute. So, when you have the verb in the negative te form and you add mo i or i, it means that the person is saying that there is no need to perform a certain action. And when you have the verb in the negative te form and you add ai ke nai or ai ke masen, it means the person is saying that there is a need to perform the action. But don't worry too much about these examples just yet. I'm just giving them as a warning so that in the future when you are reading, you won't be too hasty in judging uh, the conjugation of a verb. Not everything that ends in nai or masen is indicative of a negative sentence, is what I mean. There are two types of adjectives in Japanese. E adjectives which always end in the hiragana i, even if the rest of the adjective is written in kanji, and na adjectives, which don't end in na. The hiragana na is simply used to link the adjective to the word. Please note that I'll taught all i adjectives end in hiragana i, not all adjectives that end in hiragana i are i adjectives. Adjectives in the Japanese language can also be converted to the negative past tense and negative past tense forms. In light of all this new information, let's review how a complete beginner can analyze a sentence written in Japanese. In short, the person can translate iragana katakana into sounds, make an intuitive preliminary division of the words, taking into account the three writing systems, observe the verb to determine the tense of the sentence and whether it is affirmative or negative. In the absence of, the, of a verb, adjectives can be analyzed instead. 
observe which particle appears with each word, find the equivalences in between the original sentence and its translation, try to find answers to any question that arise, and read the whole sentence. Over time, you will be able to do these steps mentally, but at the start you might need to take notes on a paper. At the beginning of the lesson I showed you this formula in practice, but it doesn't hurt to find another example sentence and repeat the process, this time with more dynamism. So, we have this one, that means she takes a shower every morning. So, you have the sentence with the furigana, you translate the characters into sounds, you divide the words, and then you observe the verb and the particles. So, who is the phrase about? It's about her. That's why she is Kanojo. What is the object of the sentence? What does she take? Shower. So, shower is shawa. Yes, similar to the word shower. That's why it's in Katakana. Abiru is the verb. So, we would assume that it means to take. That leaves the word myasm, which by exclusion of parts, we can see it means every morning. If you were to do a little research, what conclusions would we reach? Well, we will discover that kanojo can mean both she and girlfriend. We will find that, in fact, shower means shower and that myasa means every morning. As for abiru, we will discover that this verb can be used in various circumstances. It can mean taking a shower, bathing, sunbathing, pouring water over oneself, or being, or being baited by something in the most abstract sense, such as radiation, criticism, and so on. Do you see why I like this immersive method of study? We came in contact with four words, saw them in context, found out what they meant without anyone telling us directly, and by researching to find out if we were right, we ended up gaining even more knowledge about the word in, about the words in question. That's a quadruple win, in my opinion. So what I want you to do now is to take a deep breath, get some air, eat or drink something, and then come back and rewatch the video, because you're probably feeling very overwhelmed at the moment. Rewatch the video as many times as you need to. Familiarize yourself with the topics covered, and if you think my explanations were too basic, feel free to study the various subjects in more detail. I've ended up pouring more information over your heads than I intended, but it's hard to resist the call of the grammar black hole. There is just too much to say. But always remember that grammar is a tool to, for understanding Japanese. It serves your purpose. It is not your purpose, unless you love grammar and linguistic studies. But I suspect that the goal of most of you as well as mine, is to understand Japanese rather than something more profound. And following this line of thought, you should also always bear in mind that translation is a tool to help you reach understanding. You don't want to translate, you want to understand. There will be times when the translation has little or nothing to do with the original sentence. It's normal. Don't force the two things to align. Once you have grasped these concepts, I want you to go to this site. Hold up a moment. I'm just going to put it on screen. So what I want you to do is to go to this website, which is called GLPT Sensei, and use the sentences available to train, as we did twice in this video. You can use the, these two lists the GLPT and 5 grammar list and the GLPT and 5 vocabulary list since the N5 level is the most basic of them all in opposition to the N1 which is the hardest so here on these lists you have several words that can be useful to you when you click on a word you'll be redirected to this page And each word has examples from that go from easiest to hardest. 
but they are all textbook phrases so they aren't really that hard what i wanted to do is to analyze these sentences you have the original sentence then you have the version the sweet canna then you have the same sentence in homaji and finally the translation and what i want you to do is to compare this and this and if you do this for a while you will see that it starts being really easy i'm also going to ask you to get two notebooks one bigger and one smaller alternatively you can create virtual documents to serve as notebooks this will be your dictionaries of vocabulary and kanji respectively at the end of each study section i will display a list of the words we have seen that day the ones that i find most important so that you can take note of them i will present different words at the end of each episode i will also present a list of kanji but much shorter the notebooks are meant to serve as symbols as they are something concrete they can help you stay grounded and aware of your progress the choice between physical and virtual notebooks is a very personal one but it's undeniable that virtual notebooks have some significant advantage over physical ones in a virtual notebook it is much easier to look for specific terms with a search tool you can also create categories and group similar words together with greater ease anyway the choice is yours you have a few days to decide i hope to see you at my first study section until then goodbye